Great. Uh, so, okay. uh, should I go ahead and do the announcements, Professor? Yeah, that'd be great. So, welcome everyone. I'm going to hand it to Rohan for some announcements. Okay, so uh, as we are approaching to the stage two of our uh, uh, project, so there are a few things that students have to do. Uh, the first and foremost important one is you guys have to schedule uh, team meetings with us through which we can uh, keep a track that where your project is going. So for this, uh, we have uh, three slots each week and we have defined which groups have uh, meetings in uh, those week. So you guys can go check it uh, on the home page of our course where Arvind has shared a link. You can see whose meeting is in which week and you guys can schedule it like uh, in the same way. He has also shared a link for Calendly where you can book your meetings. Uh, also, there's one uh, one thing that please schedule the meetings of that week itself. Uh, do not we uh, schedule the meetings ahead of the time. It uh, it helps us keep the track of the meeting. Uh, and there's one more. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and if you you guys are emailing your industry partners, please don't forget to CC us. It helps, uh, that has some extra points on your project. Yes, that, that should, that's it from my side, Professor. Great, thank you, Rohan, fantastic. Um, yeah, just to add to that, so yeah, our, our, our regular meetings will start. Uh, we were hoping to start a little earlier in the semester, but with doing everything remotely, it took a little longer, but that's, that's fine. Um, and yeah, the purpose of those meetings is to, to give a status of how the projects are going, and you can ask us any questions, right? So we can give back any feedback on your project. Um, the main reason we do those project meetings is that we don't want to wait till the very end of the semester to give feedback, right? Because we don't want you to get off course, basically, right? Any, if there's any problems or questions or doubts you have, we want to make sure that those get addressed early to make your overall project more successful. Um, so that's how we have those regular check-in meetings. So yeah, thank you, Rohan. Um, anything from you, Arvind? Uh, nothing, nothing from you, Professor. Okay, wonderful, perfect. All right, fantastic. All right, so if you forgive me, I'm in a different room than I normally am, so I'm just, um, just getting my chat set up to make sure I have it. Let me go ahead and, and share my screen. I realize I couldn't see the chat and share my screen at the same time, so let me do one little change here. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and share my entire screen. I think that's fine. Okay. All right, I'm actually going to do just one more thing. Okay, so here's our schedule. Okay, is that screen share coming through? Yes, Professor. Yes, Professor. All right, fantastic. Good deal. And I almost have my chat ready to go here. Um, while I'm getting that set up, just a reminder that, hey, we're starting a new module today. Um, I'm really interested in hearing some of your feedback here. Oh, yeah, I just got that. Oh, crap. Oh, I had it. Man, shoot. All right, <laughs> I just got into the meeting I wanted to. And I immediately exited it. That's embarrassing. All right, cancel. All right, because what I really want to hear, so a lot has happened since we last talked. So we had a guest lecture. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about what you thought about that. Um, maybe let's start there, right? So we had a guest lecture with Mark Hayworth last week. Um, what did you guys think of that? Uh, anything that you took away from it? Any surprises? I know it was very different than our first guest lecture. Um, so yeah, throw it in the chat window. What did you think of our guest lecture on Thursday? Very insightful, says Sai, enlightening, Abhijit, okay, great, cool, cool, cool. Um, very informative, okay, good, so we got some good feedback, okay, fantastic. Anybody, I mean, for me, I, I didn't, I, I knew Mark Hayworth a little bit, but I didn't realize the, the depth that they do that product image analysis stuff. Um, yeah, good to see real replications, didn't know people were doing all this, yeah, me neither, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, cool that he, sh so Hernan says, cool that he showed about the industry and what that's like, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so he's been in the industry for like 30 years. Um, and there's like a million things you can do with computer vision. Um, and his area is, it's, it's just one section, right? But he clearly, as far as his section, like product image analysis, he's like an expert, right? So I think that got you very deep into one area of computer vision. Um, yeah, good knowledge of real applications. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, good. So I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. That's awesome. Yeah, I, th I thought it was pretty cool. Um, 
And just a reminder that, yeah, there, that's one area, and there's many, many areas of, of computer vision, like robot guidance, all kinds of stuff. Um, and his area really is image analysis, so he has a lot of expertise in image analysis. Um, great. So Adam said, I was surprised at the impact his work had on marketing. I, I was too, right? I, whenever I see those marketing claims on packaging, I kind of assume they're just making crap up. I don't know, like, oh, it absorbs three times better. I don't know. I, I never took those that seriously. But um, I guess if they're not done properly, they can really get sued, right? So they have to, at least big companies like P&G, um, have to really put in the research time to make sure they can back up their claims in case there's a, a lawsuit or something. So. Um, so that's pretty cool, right? There's some real science happening uh, behind those claims that help sell consumer products. Um, and some of that science involves computer vision, which is pretty cool. Um, any other comments or thoughts on the guest lecture? Okay. All right, great. And you guys have had your quiz. Uh, quiz was yesterday. Um, oh, yeah, we need to find a time to go over the answers. That's right. Let's discuss that later today, uh, Rohan and Arvin. Um, so you had that quiz yesterday. Shouldn't have been too bad, hopefully. Um, we finished this module really quickly, um, and if we had more time in the schedule, I would like to spend a little more time on that last module, but hopefully you got some of the big points. Um, hopefully you picked up some of the big concepts like generalization, overfitting, all those big things. Um, those will definitely keep showing up, so I hope this was a nice introduction to machine learning. Um, and today I'm really excited because we are going to hop into a new module, and now we're really ramping up to kind of get you into some state-of-the-art techniques. So this module is going to be all about neural networks. Um, and you, maybe you've heard of neural networks. Maybe you've used neural networks. Um, <clears throat> so that's what this, this module is going to be all about, is kind of the foundations of neural networks. That will lead us into autonomous driving, really fast module. Um, I used to work in autonomous driving, so I've got a lot to say about this. So it, it's, I think it's fun to have a module about this. It's one of the probably one of the, I think, one of the most interesting applications of computer vision, driving a car with a camera. Um, so we'll spend two lectures on that, and then we're going to get into our big, main, probably most important module, which is our deep learning module. Um, but this neural network module is really going to hopefully prepare you well to get into the deep learning module. Um, the last thing I'll say about neural networks here is that they are a machine learning strategy. We'll get, we'll get into all kinds of details about neural networks. Um, but oh yeah, one last thing, sorry. Um, We've given you a little bit of a breather on the programming challenges. So I know you have project stage two that you're working on. Um, so we have a combined programming challenge. So there, there is no programming challenge for module three. There's going to be a combined programming challenge for module three and module four. So we kind of put those two together for one big programming challenge. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I'll say about that is that this programming challenge that's coming up, we have given you more time for it. Um, but it is, I think, the most challenging programming challenge, the autonomous driving. Um, I, I know students have uh, challenges with it because you're going to be implementing your own neural network. Um, it's a cool challenge because you actually get to train on some real uh, driving data from my, my last company that I worked at. I convinced them to open source some data <laughs> just for this class. Um, so you get to use some real driving data to train a neural network to drive a car. Um, but it probably is the, the hardest programming challenge, so do make sure you start that one early. Okay, so that's, I think, all I have to say about kind of where we are in the course. It's October 13th, um, and we're going to hop into neural networks. I hope you're excited. This is a really, really cool topic. Um, there's a bunch to say about neural networks. Um, neural networks really are state-of-the-art in many different disciplines, um, and spending some time learning about these things and knowing how to use them um, is a really good use of time, uh, whether you're in research or if you want to go into industry or whatever you want to do. Um, neural networks are really, really uh, powerful and really useful. Um, Arvind and Rohan, anything to add before I hop into lecture? Nothing, no, nothing from my side, Professor. Great. Thank you, guys. All right, cool. So I am in the first notebook in this repository, and this notebook is called A Brief History of Neural Networks. Um, and let's just get into it. And I, I want to... Um, Maybe Arvind and Rohan, would you mind helping me with that? I, I should have warned you before class. I apologize. But let's do a little poll, if you don't mind. Could you actually just prepare a yes, no poll? Just take a second, and I'll kind of introduce the question. We're gonna ask, I'm going to ask one, two, three. I'm going to ask four questions. And I'm very curious to see what our, our students think. Um, and could do you guys, could you just set up a yes, no poll? Is that OK? Sure, Professor. Thank you so much. All right, so while you're doing that, let me give a little background. So. 
We're going to be talking about neural networks, which are a specific kind of machine learning algorithm. Um, and as you can kind of hear in the name, neural network, so neural comes from neuron. Um, neurons are what your brain is made out of. Um, and so whenever we talk about neural networks, there's going to be the, the invitation or the desire or the temptation to, to compare what neural networks do to what humans do. Um, and it'll be fun in this module to discuss, you know, how close is a modern neural network to a human? Modern neural networks are pretty much called deep learning, um, and deep learning is often called AI um, today. Um, and AI, artificial intelligence, that kind of implies intelligence, it implies that that's what a human does, right? So I hope that you come away from this course understanding where the technology is and knowing enough about how it works to make your own judgments about how close we are to human level intelligence. Okay, so just for fun, let's work on our first poll here. So here's, here's my first fun question for the group. So let's say that you had some machine that could exactly make an atom for atom copy, right? So you could take my brain or your brain or Rohan's brain or Arvin's brain, and you could take every single atom in their whole brain um, and make an exact copy of where all those atoms are, their exact locations, and make an exact atom copy of someone's brain. So my question to you is, would it think, right? Would that, would that thing that we created, would it be capable of thinking? So let's go ahead and open the poll, guys, if it's ready. OK. All right, and I can't, for some reason, I can't see the poll today. That's strange. I, I made the mistake of changing my setup a little bit. I'll, I'll have it back by Thursday. Um, are there poll results in yet? Uh, not yet, Professor. Still. Okay, cool. Let me know when you're done. No problem. Take your time. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing them. Uh, Professor, do you see the results? I've shared the results with you. Um, I don't see them. I think it's my own fault because I have set them up. Would you mind just telling me them? Sorry. Uh, so 36% 36 per, uh, 36 of people say yes, uh, it would think. Mm -hmm. And 64% pe uh, people say they won't. Uh, the brain won't think. Oh, interesting. Okay, so most people say that even if we could take take my brain or your brain or someone's brain, even if it had all the same atoms, it still wouldn't think. Hmm, interesting, okay, very interesting. My vote, I think I think yes, but I don't know, it's, it's kind of tricky, right? For those of you who said no, what's missing, right? Is there something beyond atoms that lets people think? Th throw it in the chat window, what do you think? Is there something other than atoms that lets people think? Your soul, share, that's probably the most common answer. Consciousness, says Hernan. So those of you who said that, I think soul, that makes sense. You know, there's kind of, you know, if, if you are religious, you know, you might believe that there's a layer beyond the physical and that, that makes sense. Um, as far as like consciousness, right? Um, like, what is that, right? <laughs> Can we scientifically define consciousness? Is it a result of our matter or is it something else, right? Can we measure consciousness? Um, so I don't know, something fun to think about. Let's keep moving. Um, so I think even less of you are going to say yes to this, actually. <laughs> so, let's, let, but maybe I don't know. Let, let's see here. So, um, as you might know, the the neurons, those are the brain cells in your in your brain, right? That 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 process electrical signals um, that, that let you think and stuff. Um, so if you could make a copy of every neuron in your brain, so this is not the atoms anymore, right? These, these are the neurons, the actual cells. Would that think like a human? So let's go ahead and open up that poll. Um, so yeah, so if you could make a neuron for neuron copy, and like I said, sorry Rohan, I can't see the poll results. I don't know why. It's my own fault, but if you could read them to me when they're available, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, Professor. Thank you so much. So, Professor, 62% people say yes, 
and 38% people say no it won't oh wow so the class has shifted a little bit very interesting here's what i'm really curious for those of you who switched who on the first question said no the atom copy won't work but said yes the neuron copy will work is there a certain reason why do you why are you more confident in neuron copies than atom copies electronic signal says videhi okay any other answers Okay, nothing yet, no problem. All right, one more, it looks like. I just keep coming back to Cylons, okay. <laughs> All right, um, so let's keep moving here. So that's really interesting. I'm glad we got your input there. Um, so next question to the class, this is another yes, no poll. Is it possible to, mo so we talked about neurons, just taking the, the biological device, the cell, the neuron, right? Now what about math, All right? So math is pretty powerful. You can do some cool stuff with math, right? Um, what if, is it possible to model the way the brain works using math, right? Can math describe what happens in your brain? Can it describe thinking? Can it describe consciousness? Is that even possible? So let's open up that poll, please. Uh, professor, so 61 percent students say that yes, it is possible uh, to model the brain, uh, show mathematics to model the use mathematics to model the brain, and 39 percent mm -hmm. people say it is not possible to do it. Ah, oh, very interesting. Okay, great. So over half the class thinks that we can use math to model how our brain works. And I guess I didn't say in this question, you know, like to full human level consciousness, but I think it's kind of implied. So very interesting. Okay. So it sounds like a lot of you kind of believe that artificial general intelligence, AGI, where we have computers that are equally as intelligent as humans is possible. So that that's interesting. Very cool. Okay. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just leave this one open. We'll skip the poll so we can get into the meat of today's discussion. But just a fun last question to throw at you, you know, do you think an algorithm will ever be conscious in the way a human is, right? And actually, maybe we do the poll. I'm just curious because I, I haven't asked this question directly yet. So let's open up the poll if you don't mind, Rohan, just one last time. Um, and yeah, do you think an algorithm, like the ones we're about to talk about, or any, any algorithm on a computer, will it ever be conscious just like a human is, right? Or in the same way that a human is? Uh, Professor, 52 percent people say that algorithm will be co as conscious as human and 48 percent mm -hmm. students say that it won't be as conscious as humans. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, great. So about half the class. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah, I think I am just barely in the, well, not barely. I'm in the no camp. I feel like no, but I really don't know. And what's really interesting is if you believe some of the more progressive thinkers of our day, some people think this will happen in our lifetime. So by the time we're all old, you know, and I'll be like, uh, I'll be like 100 and you guys will be 90. We might know, <laughs> we might know what the answer is. <laughs> Maybe, right? It'll be interesting to see. <laughs> all right, cool. So what I want to get into now is this. So these questions that I just asked you, like they might seem kind of science fiction-y, but literally not that long ago in the 1940s when computers were relatively new, um, these two guys, Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts, um, they basically wrote a paper um, that, that really tried to, to figure out if they could model how a brain works using math. 
Walter Pitts was one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. So just a brilliant mathematician, probably one of the uh, most uh, uh, one of the most well-known mathematicians of the 20th century. Warren McCulloch was a psychologist, so not a mathematician, but still a, a very influential thinker. He's got some books on this kind of stuff. And they wrote this paper called A Logical Calculus of the Imminent of the Ideas Imminent in Nervous Activity. And they basically tried to use math to describe how your brain worked, which might sound cool. So they literally tried to do that, and they came up with this equation. So let's get into the math. Let's Before we talk about whether they were wrong or they were right or all that good stuff, let's see what they really did, right? So, so here is the equation, this one right here, that they developed. I've, I've rearranged it a little bit. If you read their paper, it's going to be a little harder to read because they use some crazy notation. But, but distilled, um, this is the equation that they used. And this equation is supposed to model a single neuron. So you may know about neurons, you may not. It, it's not a big deal either way. Um, but a neuron is one of the cells in your brain. And just like I saw a question a minute ago, someone was talking about the inputs and outputs. Yeah, so Austin, you said you were talking about the input and output of neurons. So this is exactly what uh, Pitts and McCulloch did. So they said, let's forget about the whole brain for a second. Let's just focus on the nerve cells, right? And it turns out those nerve cells, if you study them, they have kind of inputs and outputs. They, they take inputs from other neurons, and then they, they, they either fire or they don't. They can fire an electrical signal. Um, and this little piece of mathematics, um, it describes, well, according to McCulloch and Pitts, it is a, an approximation or a model of how a neuron works. So let's get into, get into some more detail. Um, so notice the products. We've, we've discussed dot product a little bit in this class. Um, X is going to be the input to our neuron. Uh, we'll get into W and B in a second. Um, but just the thing to notice, the, the, the one thing to take away at face value, looking at this equation, is that there's only two possible outputs from this model. What are the, what are the two possible outputs? There's only two things that this neuron can say. <laughs> what are the two possible outputs from this function? Yeah, 0 and 1. Abhijit, Ravina, Akshay, Manasa, good. Pooja, every, yeah, great. So yeah, it can only be zero or one. So part of what they're trying to do here is model the fact that neurons in your brain, they either fire an electrical signal or they don't, which is true. So that, that's, that's grounded in truth about how your brain works. OK, so right away, I'm going to throw you into a question <laughs> right away. Um, so here's the question. And we will, uh, I think we'll do a poll again. This will just be an ABCD poll. Um, and let me just walk you through the question real quick. Um, so the question is, so here, here's the equation. This is a dot product. Um, we'll cover dot products in a second. We've, we've talked about them a little bit in this class already. So I'm giving you some values of this vector w. So I'm saying, OK, let w be 1 minus 2, 0. It, it, it's a vector. Um, and I'll just go ahead and tell you w stands for weights. So this is the weights, w-e-i-g-h-t-s, weights. Um, and b, does anyone know what b stands for in neural networks? Yeah, so Hernan, Sean, Mir, yep, good. So it stands for bias. Cool. All right, and we'll get into that in more detail. Don't worry. I just want to give you some vocabulary early on. Um, and I would like you to solve this problem. So given these weights, given this input, 111, uh, what is the output? So please take, um, let's, let's say, 45 seconds or so, um, and then we'll go over the answer. And I apologize. I've taken away your answer. All right, there you go. I might. I'll leave it up there. All right, cool. I'm trying to do one screen today. It's a huge mistake. <laughs> I will be back on two screens tomorrow or Thursday. So, Professor, 34% uh, mm -hmm. people voted for A, 31% mm -hmm. uh, voted for B, then mm -hmm. again 31% voted for C, and then 3% mm -hmm. of people voted for D. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rohan. All right, cool. I promise I'll have my screen fixed next time, but I, I do enjoy the dialogue. Thank you. All right, <laughs> perfect. Um, so, so let's have a look at what we do here. And I was going to draw this actually, but I think we can talk through it. So recall that a dot product, when we do a dot product like we have here, we take each element in W and multiply it by each element in X, and then we add the results together. So we have 1 times 1, which is 1, plus negative 2 times 1, which is negative 2, plus 0 times 1, which is 0. So this dot product evaluates to basically 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. And some folks out there said, hey, the answer is negative 1. I'm done, right? OK. So I tricked you. If you got that answer, um, you're close. So we're not quite done, because remember the formula over here, it says, OK, do the dot product, and then add b. So we add 0. So we still have negative 1 as this result. But then if we zoom out and look at the whole equation, it says, OK, if this whole thing is greater than 0, then the answer is 1. And if this whole thing is, is not greater than 0 otherwise, then the answer is 0. So really, because of the way this function is set up, the answer can only be A or B. Hopefully that makes sense. The answer can only be 0 or 1. And because um, w, the dot product of W and X is negative 1 plus 0 is negative 1, this is not greater than 0, then the answer is actually uh, A. It's 0. So hopefully that makes sense. If not, uh, come back and review it. Um, but this is actually, you've, done, you've, you've, you've plugged in numbers and you've solved your first little neural network with a neuron size of 1. So this is great. The type of math that we're doing is really going to continue all the way to deep learning. Um, it's going to, this, this math will not go away. So it's worth paying attention to. Okay. So here is a way to draw what we're doing. So you've seen the equation for the McCulloch Pitts neuron model that we, we talked about in McCulloch and Pitts developing back in the 40s. Um, and what happens is we, we take all these inputs, these different x's, right? This is just a way to draw it. You take all these x's. Um, you do the dot product. This is just the formula for the dot product. Multiply each w times each x and add them all together. Um, and then you add this b thing. Um, uh, one way to think about this is that this is like a step function. So basically, you, you can move b to this side of the equation. And if w dot x is bigger than minus b, then basically you're on this side of the step function and the output is 1. Um, if that makes sense, great. If not, don't worry about it too much. This is just a way you, you may see these step functions drawn um, in books or in papers. So I just wanted to show it to you here, but I won't, I won't quiz you on, on a step function like this or anything like that. Um, but just know that this is a way that, that you may see neurons uh, drawn in, in papers or in, or in books. Okay, um, great. All right, so let's hop into another question. Um, so in person, this is kind of fun to do on whiteboards, but honestly, the class is too big at this point. Back in the first year, I think we did this on whiteboards. But um, So another question for you guys, and actually, we, we can't do a poll because, um, because this is not multiple choice, but I just want you to take a second to think about it. Um, and I'm going to switch to my drawing application in a second so we can kind of draw in here. Um, but what I want you to think about is here's the two-dimensional case. So in this first question that I gave you, um, I gave you three, a, a length, vector of length three, and, and the length of the vector could be anything, but I want to simplify here and think about the two-dimensional case for a second, because it's going to be very relevant. So if we think about the two-dimensional case, so here's our formula again. We can take our two inputs, so x, our, our input x, it's a vector, but if it's the two-dimensional case, then x just has a length of two, and there's, there's only two variables in our vector x, so there's x1 and x2. Um, we can plot those variables on a on a scatter plot or a plot like this, um, and we can think about for we can think about um, for which regions of this plot is our equation true. Hopefully that makes sense. Where in this plot, for what combinations of x one and x two, if w equals one and two, one comma two, and b is one, where is our equation going to be true? So take a second to think about that. Maybe go ahead and write this down if you have paper in front of you. Um, so the values of w are 1 and 2, and b equals 1. Uh, I have to take away your screen just for one second while I pull up my drawing application. But go ahead and start thinking about this. How would you solve this? Where will um, the value of the function be equal to 1?
yeah, so just take a, take 30 more seconds, give it some thought, think about the math you'd have to do, and then we'll go through the answer. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my screen here. So here is the problem you're thinking about. Let me make this nice and big. Okay, great. All right, and then I want my brush. Cool. And color, blue. Cool. All right, great. Okay, so let, let's think of this now. So where in this plot is the is our neuron going to be? Or are we going to get a value of 1 from our function? So what I'd like to do is to express this as an equation. So this is the two-dimensional case. So really, we can take this dot product, and we can break it apart into this. We can say um, that this is w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2 plus b is greater than 0. So I've just taken that equation, and I, I know that the dot product is equal to the weight times the, the value of x. Um, and I've just broken it apart, and I know this is the two-dimensional case, so there's only two values to deal with here. OK, and I'm going to go ahead and plug in <clears throat> my values. So I know that w1 is, is 1. So I'm going to say, just change this to x1, because it's, it's 1 times x1. And I know that w2 is, is 2, so plus 2 times x2. OK. Um, plus b is greater than 0. And just as a reminder, you know, we, we've taken McCulloch and Pitt's formula, and now I'm just trying to get you to think about it geometrically a little bit, because it's going to matter a lot in a minute when we get into talking about um, the McCulloch and Pitt's neuron model and how we, how we learn, um, how, we learn uh, how neural networks learn, basically. So, so bear with me here if this doesn't quite make sense why we're discussing this geometric interpretation. It will shortly, I promise. Okay. So I have this equation. Oh, sorry, and b is 1. Let me go ahead and plug that in. I shouldn't talk while I, uh, while I do math. OK, so there we go. Hopefully that makes sense. I've plugged in w and b. Now, um, this is x2. I kind of like to think about this as like y. This is like our, our, um, our dependent variable. So I'm going to solve for x2 is what I'm going to do. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get 2x2 on one side. Like this is equal to, or is greater than, excuse me, greater than. Um, do I, how do I want to handle this? Yeah, I guess I'll do this. Minus x1. So I subtracted the x1 over here. Um, minus 1. So I've moved that stuff over. Oops, sorry, you can't see my screen. Sorry, there we go. Cool. All right, great. So um, I've just moved this over. This is a greater than sign. I'm going to divide by 2. So I get x2 um, is greater than um, minus 1 half uh, x1 minus 1 half. So I've just rearranged this into an equation where I've solved for x2. And again, i got to scroll down just a little bit. Sorry about that. There we go. OK, cool. All right, so I've just taken this equation. I've plugged in w and b, and I have this. OK, so here's my big question that I want to ask the group. What kind of shape will this make on this plot? If I go and plot this thing up here, right, uh, what kind of shape will it make? Please throw it in the chat window. What kind of shape will we see? I, see, I think Sai has already at least partially answered it. Yeah, it's a line. Yeah, so Sai is saying area above a line. Yep, perfect, it's a line. Good. So this line has a slope of negative 1 half, and it has a y-intercept of minus 1 half as well. Um, is that right? Did I make any mistakes here? I feel like that's a weird choice for me to make. Let's see, so I plugged in 1 here, I plugged in 2 here, I plugged in 1 there, and then I subtracted both of those over, and I divided by 2. Okay, I think that's right. All right, if you see a mistake in my math, let me know. Um, but I solved here. And basically, <clears throat> if I extend this plot just a little bit like that, and I make, let's say I make this minus 1, and I make this plus 1, then the y-intercept is going to be minus 1 half, and it's going to have a slope of minus 1 half. So we're going to go um, we're going to go over 1, down 2, basically. Rise over, oh, no, sorry, uh, rise over run. So, so we're going to go down 1, over 2. So it's going to be something like this. The exact details aren't aren't too important, but we're going to see basically a line like this. Um, and wherever x2 is greater than this value, which should be everything above, basically for all the region up here, 
we're going to get a positive value. So it's, it's the shaded region up here. OK, so hopefully that makes some sense. Um, and just to tie this back, right? So I'm kind of I'm asking you to think about the McCulloch and Pitts neuron, and I'm asking you to think of a geometric interpretation. And what we just covered here in, in our drawing is that okay, for any any combination of x1 and x2 that are to the right and up of this line, we're going to get a one. It's going to fire, and for everything below, it's not going to fire. So the McCulloch and Pitts neuron it divides our input space in the two-dimensional case. It divides it into uh, into two regions, and it divides it by a line. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. In the interest of time, I think I'm going to keep moving. This might be a good quiz question. So this is a very similar question, but I've just changed the values. Um, when I change the values, I still get a line. So we still divide the input space into two areas, but the position and the slope of the line may change. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so we're going to keep going and explain kind of how all this fits together, I promise. Um, but that's the McCulloch and Pitts neuron. And I would say just know that it's good to know the formula for it and know that in two dimensions, it divides our input space into um, just with a line. And that's going to become very important because we're going to go to higher dimensional space soon. OK. So we've, I've shown you an equation. You know, I did some talking about it. Um, but let me just finish up the story of McCulloch and Pitts briefly. So they had this paper. They talked about it. Uh, it was very controversial because they were explaining, you know, uh, a simple model of how brains might work, which you could imagine would make, make people say, oh, that's ridiculous. Brains don't work like this, you know. Um, so the history is really, really interesting. But the thing I want to point out is that they presented this model, but they did not present a way for their model to learn. So when we get into to neural networks in full force, we're going to be, these models are going to be learning from data. Um, and McCulloch and Pitts did not present a way for these models to learn. So a little bit later, this guy named Hebb, Donald Hebb, um, he, he introduced some ideas in, a, in a, I believe it was a book, um, and, and suggested some ways that the brains might learn. Um, and as you notice in these examples up here, I just gave you some weights. I said, hey, w equals 1 minus 2, right? Um, and just to give you a little bit of the, the concept here, so the idea of these weights, um, the weights represent, if you have more than one neuron, which we will soon, um, they represent the strength of connection between neurons. And what, what Donald Hebb proposed, he said, okay, maybe your brain learns by increasing the strength of connection between its neurons. Maybe that's what learning is, right? That was his idea. Um, so if that's what learning is, and we want to make our neural network code learn, um, then we need to change those weights to fit our data. Hopefully that idea makes sense. So maybe learning just consists of finding good weights that, that make our model fit our data well. And we'll get into that in a lot more detail. But, but that's the idea that, that Hebb suggested. So we now get to talk about someone very special in the history of neural networks. I like talking about Frank Rosenblatt. Um, so there's this guy named Frank Rosenblatt who did some really amazing research. Um, he kind of he kind of picked up and moved forward with this neural network research that that McCulloch and Pitts had done. Um, so he he gave his uh, well let me back up a little bit. So at the time this was the 1950s by now. Um, it's very interesting. So computers were around. Um, but to go like fast enough and to be able to um, to be able to really uh, test these these devices, it would actually made more sense to actually build a physical machine. So when Frank Rosenblatt started experimenting with these algorithms, um, he first experimented on an IBM 704 computer on one of these guys. Um, but to actually get the machine to do what he wanted and process enough data, it made more sense to build a physical machine. So if you look at these wires, <laughs> this is crazy. So this is Frank Rosenblatt. Look at all these wires. Every wire in that in that machine, I believe, represents a, a weight, so like a physical connection. So instead of writing code to do what we're about to do, he actually built a physical machine. This is the machine. It's huge. Those are all the wires. Crazy, right? Um, so he had to give his machine a name. And I, I like the name he gave it. And it's still the same name we use today sometimes. Um, he called his machine a perceptron perceptron because it percepted things, right? It had perception. Um, so this was the work he did at Cornell in the 1950s. And let's let's discuss how it worked, what his ideas were, because um, they're, they're pretty cool. OK. So to discuss how Frank Rosenblatt's perceptron helped neural networks learn or helped neurons learn, 
Um, we're going to borrow this example from this book called Probably Approximately Correct. Um, this was a book that I recommended last module. It's really, really good. Maybe some summer reading if you are interested. Um, but in that book, Leslie Valiant, uh, the author, he walks through the perceptron algorithm, and I'm going to borrow his example here. It's a really good example. So in his example, we just have really simple data. So we have x, just like we did in our last module, and we again have two-dimensional data. Um, we're going to get to higher dimensional data and to images and all kinds of cool stuff soon, but first let's just start in two-dimensional space. So this is our data, x. And Leslie Valiant also gives us some, some, some y's, some labels. So notice that there are six uh, data points here, one, two, three, four, five, six. And there are six labels, zeros and ones. Um, and I can actually scatter them here. So this is just some toy data that we're going to play with. So he here's the data. So uh, purple, purple, I believe, means uh, zero. Yep, OK. And then yellow means one. So these are our six data points. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to see, OK, can Frank Rosenblatt and his perceptron algorithm, can it learn a, a, a single neuron, you know, a tiny little neural network that only has one neuron that's modeled by, by this equation, uh, this equation here. Um, can Frank Rosenblatt's model learn to model this data? And I know this seems like, hey, what does this have to do with computer vision? These are just points on a plane. Just bear with me. We'll get to images soon, I promise. It's going to be uh, worth doing it in two dimensions first. OK. So that's the task. This is the model. Um, and I break it out here into the two-dimensional case. So. As I mentioned for this example, we're just going to use two dimensions. So here I've taken the equation and I've broken it down um, just to have w1x1 and w2x2 because we know we only have a two-dimensional problem. Now I'm going to do something just a little sneaky that's going to make life easier mathematically. So I don't love having this b, actually. So instead of, of having this b to make life easier and to make Frank Rosenblatt's perceptron algorithm easier to understand, I'm going to lose the b. And I'm going to actually swap out our 2D problem for a 3D problem. So I'm going to I'm going to lose the B, but instead I'm going to take our data and let's look at this line that I that I have in Python here. And let me scroll down a little bit. There we go. Okay. So if you look at this line with me right here, um, so can anyone tell me what I'm doing here? Actually, I kind of have it in text, but just for fun, right? What does this line of Python do? Yeah, it adds a column of ones. Yeah, so Hernan, Supam, great. Yeah, Abhijit, awesome, cool. So this just adds a column of ones. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that on purpose. I'll show you. So so here's the new x. Remember, x used to be just these two columns. I'm gonna add a column of ones. So and what what it lets me do is it lets me pretend like I have a three dimensional problem. And this this is just gonna make our math easier in a second. Um, so if you look here, right, I've I've lost the b. There's no bias term anymore. Um, and now uh, I've replaced it with w3x3. Um, but now, really, uh, we know that x3, this third x, it's just ones. I've replaced it all with ones here. So really, w3 is just its just that bias term. It's just the b term. Um, but by rearranging it like this, it's going to make our math a little bit easier. So if you follow that, great. If not, go back and have a look at the notes later. It's not, not too big of a deal. Um, but now we can really code some stuff up and we can see how Frank Rosenblatt's perceptron algorithm worked. So first, uh, I'm going to actually write this in Python. So here's my awesome Python uh, method that implements the McCulloch and Pitts neuron. Um, notice that my b, my bias term, is missing. And I'm, I'm able to do that because I've done this trick where I've added this extra 1 to the end of, um, to the end of my data. And I've let this third weight, I've let that basically be our bias term. So I have a little bit of a simplified equation here. So there's our, our Python method that implements the McCulloch and Pitts neuron. Um, and to show you how the perceptron algorithm works, I'm going to start by setting our weights to, to 0. This is the first step of the perceptron algorithm. Frank, Frank Rosenblatt says, hey, just make all your weights 0. Um, and now what we're going to do is this. So to try to learn, to try to get our single little neuron to learn from data, we're going to iterate through our data and do something uh, pretty simple. So let me show you how it works. So we're going to start at 0. And what am I doing here by saying i equals 0 and doing x bracket i comma colon? What, what is that doing exactly in words? How would you describe that? Yeah, it's the first data point. Thank you, Abhijit. Yep, I'm taking the first, the first row, the first data point. Perfect. So what I'm going to do. 
I'm taking that first data point, so here it is, 411, and I'm checking what is the label, what is y of i, so what is y of, of 0, and it's 1. And now I'm going to pass it through. I'm going to take this example and these weights. And remember, my, my neuron is just that simple function that I wrote, right? So up here, I have this just really simple, nice function, right? And I'm going to pass my, my weights and my data through that function. And I'm going to get false out. So the, the model, the neuron, is saying, hey, the label should be 0. It should be false. Um, but y of 0, our first, our first label is actually 1. So did our little neuron get it right, or did it get it wrong? What do you think? For our very first little prediction we made, were we right or were we wrong? Throw it in the chat window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we were wrong. And the way we know is that, so y of 0 is 1. Remember y, this is our, this is our labels. Um, and, and our neuron, when we, when we pass our, our data and our weights into our neuron, this gives us our prediction. And our prediction is false, and these don't match. So one is not the same thing as false. This is like true, and this is like zero. Um, so we're incorrect, right? So Frank Rosenblatt, in his algorithm, his perceptron algorithm, he said, OK, if you get it wrong, do something really simple. He said, do this. He said, take your weights and add to your weights the current example. And it's kind of like the kind of the thinking here is that the prediction is too small. The prediction it made isn't big enough. So just add your example to your weights. That's all he's saying to do. Remember that our weights, right, are, or excuse me, our example is 411, and we initialized our weights to be 0. So our new weight value is actually just equal to 411, because we had an initial set of weights of 0, 0, 0. Um, we added our example, so now our new weights are 411. So that was actually one little iteration of learning <laughs> using the perceptron algorithm. Let's, let's keep going, um, and then we'll tie it all together. But this is really at the heart of, of how Frank Rosenblatt's perceptron algorithm learns. So let's go to our next example here. So we did the zeroth example. Now we'll do the, the first example. And for x equals 1, the example is 1, 2, 1. The label is 0. The label is 0. The prediction of our model is false. Um, and actually, did I make a mistake? Because hmm. I think I'm saying here that it's wrong again, but it looks like it's right. Hmm. What have I done wrong here? Maybe I didn't do this step. Oh, I bet I didn't. Yep, that's funny. So my notes, I say, oh, it's wrong. But if you look here, the label is 0, and the prediction is false. These match. But I forgot to actually run this cell. <laughs> that's funny. OK. Right. Oh, but x is wrong. Oh, gosh. All right, I got to start over. <laughs> You have to be careful in notebooks sometimes because the order matters, and I violated the order. <laughs> all right, don't do that. Make sure you run all your cells. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. That's probably one of the biggest complaints about notebooks is if you run things out of order, um, you may get a different result. OK, um, so where are we? Uh, we have made it to here. So now we should actually get it. Yeah, OK, cool. So look, so now the label is 0. But the prediction is 1, right? So we're wrong, OK. But notice this time that our prediction was kind of like too big. It was like it was a 1, and it should have been a 0. So if our prediction is too large, or our dot product is too large, then Frank Rosenblatt says, OK, don't, don't add the example to your weights. In this case, subtract. So take your weights, uh, subtract your example, and you'll get your new weights. Um, so let's look at one more example. Hopefully that makes sense. So all, all Frank Rosenblatt says is, is to process your data one at a time. If you get it uh, wrong, either add or subtract the example from your weights. And if you get it right, and then maybe you've already guessed. Let me show you, actually. So here's an example that we get right. Um, and let me just ask you, right? So what do you think Frank Rosenblatt recommends doing if you get the example right? What should you do to your weights? What do you think? What would you do if you were writing the perceptron algorithm? Yeah, nothing, right? Yeah, so Sai, good job. Yeah, don't do anything, right? You got it right. Okay, cool. All right. So I've taken Frank Rosenblatt's equation back from the 1950s, or taken his idea, and I've put it in a very simple Python, um, Python method called update neuron. So an update neuron, you give it some weights, you give it an example, and you give it the correct label, either a 1 or a 0. And we go through. We process the, the example and the weights through the model, and we compare that to the prediction, basically. And if we get it wrong this way, if, if our prediction is 0 and our label is 1, then we add our weights, just like Rosenblatt told us to do. 
if the prediction is one and the label is zero, then we subtract our, 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 our uh, example from our weights. This is, again, just what Rosenblatt told us to do. And then if we get it right, we don't do anything. We just, just I'm just going to print correct, and I'm going to return the weights. So this is Rosenblatt's algorithm 70 years later in a, in a Python script. And what I really want to show you is I want to visualize together how this works. Let me run this cell. OK. So I, I kind of skipped over this method. This is just a visualization method. Um, but what I really want to show you is this, the result of that visualization method. So I have this cell. Hopefully this all shows up on screen. Yep, OK, pretty good. Um, and every time I run this cell, I'm going to update the neuron. So I'm going to take the weights and the current example and the current label. I'm going to check if it's right. If it's right, I'm going to leave it alone. If it's wrong, I'm either going to add or subtract the example. And then every time I'm going to plot the decision boundary. So here's those six examples that we saw earlier. They look a little bit squished, right? They look a little bit squished right now. And it's just because our line is like way off. It's not really where it's supposed to be. Um, and then I'm just incrementing my counter. So I'm just, I'm just adding one to the counter so I can keep iterating through our data. Um, two questions here for you. So you may have guessed I'm going to run this cell by pressing Control-Enter. I'm going to run it a bunch of times. And we're going to see if our model can learn to separate the ones from the zeros. Before I do that, uh, two questions for you. First, notice that I, I have some purple dots here. And I have some yellow dots. But I have one red dot. Um, why do you think I've chosen to color one dot red in this plot decision boundary method, right? Why did I choose to color one of these these points a different color? Any ideas? Why am I coloring one differently? Good guess, Hernan. Not correct. Yeah, so Abhijit, good job. You were working on that one, right? So yeah, so great guess, Hernan. The answer, though, is that we are... We are just, that's the one that we're processing. Remember that, 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 that um, the, the perceptron algorithm only processes one example at a time, and this is the one that we're processing. So I, I've colored that example. Okay, one last thing for you. Um, why am I doing this? So first of all, what does the percent sign do in Python? What does the percent sign do? Modulus, yep, excellent, good, good. And why do I need a modulus, right? Why can't I just do i equals i plus one, right? Why do I have to do this modulus thing? Yeah, iterating over and over. So when i ends up reaching 5 for the length of the array, I, I can't keep going past the end. I'm going to start over at the beginning, right? So that lets us do that. OK. So let's do it. So I just ran this cell one time, and it's told me, hey, you know, you were incorrect. And I've computed some new weights for you. Here they are, right? 411. OK. And we saw that same result earlier. So I'm going to press Control-Enter, and I'm going to run again. And it's going to say, oh, hey, you got it wrong again. So I've updated the weights for you just by subtracting the example. And notice where our line moves. So our line, remember that, that first exercise we did, we found out that in, in two-dimensional space, the perceptron algorithm, or the, the, the McCulloch and Pitts neuron, it just, it just make, basically makes a line that separates your plane into two areas. OK, so that line has moved because our weights have changed. OK, let's run it again. So here, we actually got it right. So this point, this point is actually on the right side of the line. So this, it's already classified correctly. Um, this is a value of 1. This must be flipped, I think. So it must be things on this side must be zeros, and things on this side must be 1, I think. Um, so let's keep moving here. So there we go. It processed this point. This line kind of got off. It seems like it's not really learning, right? Not great. Uh, but let's keep going. Let's see. OK, and not that great. And here's some new weights kind of bouncing around. Uh, maybe it's getting warmer. Now the line's here. Let's see. And maybe think in your mind where you think it's going to end, like what's going to happen. Let me run it again. Got that one correct. <laughs> what if this demo didn't work? That'd be funny. All right, let's see. Ah, getting closer. OK, that looks maybe pretty good. Um, think in your head what you're looking for, right? What, what would be a good outcome, right? OK, now this is kind of interesting. So it learned again. And I'm going to actually keep running this just a few more times. And you might notice something. So if you notice, it's getting everything correct. And that's because it's found a line that correctly separates the purple, the, uh, the, the examples that have a label of 0, uh, from the, the ones, the examples that have a label of, of 1. So it's found the plane or the line that correctly divides the data. right? And it's done that just by doing this little trick that Frank Rosenblatt invented in the 50s. And the trick is, just take your weights, set them equal to 0, go through your data one by one, 
If you get it wrong, either add or subtract your weights, depending on how you get it wrong. And if you get it right, don't do anything. And as I've shown you in this little example, uh, Frank Rosenblatt in this case gets it right, right? So does he get it right every time? We'll see. But here, this actually does learn. <clears throat> it, it basically trains a McCulloch and Pitts neuron to correctly separate these three examples that are labeled one from these three examples that are labeled zero. <laughs> so size says impressive. <laughs> Good. All right, I think it's impressive too. It's pretty cool. Now, we're going to talk a bunch about how useful this is and what it really means, but I, I want to keep going with this. I don't want to give away the answers yet, so <laughs> let's keep going with the story. So I just want to point out that something pretty cool happens, and I, I would recommend, you know, uh, when, you have, when you have a chance to look back, you know, review what happened here. So I've made this little table, and it, it tracks every single step. So as we go through our iterations, it's tracking, you know, here is the, our weight, kind of our hypothesis. Um, here's the classification, here's the example, here's the true ground truth y value. And as we go through, right, this, this tracks how it updates at every step. And notice by the end, right, we're getting everything right, basically. And the three minus six and minus one. And we, we're done, we've perfectly um, learned a rule that perfectly separates our plus and minus examples. Okay, so I think hopefully you have an idea you have an idea of how the perceptron algorithm works. And I think it's impressive too. So I don't know how many folks think it, I know Sai thinks it's impressive, I, I do too, I think it's pretty cool. Um, but what I really wanna push on is how impressive is it, right? Is this, you know, is this something we should take seriously, right? Could this really be a really powerful model that could be useful in, in other domains like computer vision? So what I want to push you on is here are three data sets. So I've, I've made three data sets. And you see we've got the blue points that have values of, of, of 0 and the yellow points that have values of 1. Um, and that could be flipped. That's OK if it is. Um, but you see these three data sets. And in each case, a linear separator does exist. So there is a line out there that will separate these. And the question I want to ask you guys is do you think that the perceptron algorithm will find it? Right, so if we let loose Frank Rosenblatt's perceptron algorithm, right, will it find the right line? Will it find the line that correctly separates all the yellows from all the blues? So answer choice A is yes, and it will only take a finite number of steps, like you know, a certain number. B is yes, but it will take an infinite or exponentially large number of steps. So remember we talked last time about in, in the Learning to See series that hey. You might have an algorithm that in theory works great, but in practice takes exponentially long to finish, right? Which is not very useful, right? Um, and then if you're really a pessimist, you'll say, ah, oh, no, this is Frank Rosenblatt got lucky, you know, um, there's no way that we're gonna be able to find the right separator, the right line in every case. So let's open up that poll if you don't mind, Rohan. Um, and if you don't mind, just if you can read them to me when it's done, but let's give everyone about, let's just give 15 seconds. Let's give 15 seconds or so to answer this poll. And I'm curious to see what you guys think. So yes, it will find it in a finite number of steps. Yes, it will take, it will find it, but it will take an infinite or very large exponential number of steps. Or C, it will not find the right answer. Uh, let me try, Professor. There's some issue with the poll right now. Okay, yeah, it's up. Oh, okay, no problem at all. Okay. It's up, it's up. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, what do we, I can't see it, unfortunately. What, what do we have? So that's 68% uh, students who say A, and then 27% mm -hmm. students who say B. Okay, great. Anyone for C? Any pessimist? No. <laughs> no, no one is a pessimist. Okay, <laughs> that's funny. All right, great. All right, cool. So you guys believe in Frank Rosenblatt. That's cool. Okay, great. All right, cool. So let's get into it. Let's find out. So here's an animation I made um, that, that uses the, the, the perceptron algorithm. And it's just going through and iterating, and it's counting the steps on the bottom. Um, and if you follow it, you'll see that eventually, in all three cases, um, it actually finds the right answer. So it just started over, so you'll have to watch it again. But um, the answer is A, so it, it finds it, and it doesn't. It does not actually take um, an exponential number of steps. It actually does it in, in a polynomial number of steps, um, which is pretty cool. So let, let's look at this quote from this this book that we're referencing here. I think this is a great quote. It says, 
The interesting fact about the perceptron algorithm is that in spite of our lack of control over its exact fate as we let it loose on arbitrary data, it nonetheless manages to achieve something quite remarkable. The basic statement of the power of this algorithm, proved by Albert no Novikov soon after the algorithm was first proposed, is that if there is a true linear separator, if there's an actual line that separates the data, the algorithm is sure to find it, and this has been proven, um, or another hypothesis that also correctly classifies the examples um, after having made misclassifications only a finite number of times. So we can actually prove, and it was proven just a, a little bit after this algorithm was published, that, that, it, that it will find the answer every time. Now, I think that's remarkable, because remember, we're just kind of taking a guess. We're only processing data one point at a time, right? That's pretty crazy, right? Just one point at a time, processing the data, and eventually we'll find the right answer. So this idea of making tiny little improvements over time, that is a, a, a huge theme in neural networks. The way modern neural networks learn is not quite like this, and we'll see why soon. Um, but the overall idea is, is quite similar to what Frank Rosenblatt proposed in the 50s, um, of taking these little baby steps, these tiny little steps, um, and at the end, you've learned something pretty remarkable. So, so that, that's a big theme that you'll see in neural networks. OK, so that's cool. Um, the last thing I'll point out is that the, you can look at the proof, if you want, of, 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 of the fact that it will find the, the, the best, uh, will find a line eventually. Um, it, it, it does have an upper bound on the time, and it's described as m over n squared, basically. So it turns out that the closer the data points are together, the longer it f takes to find the data. Um, so if you have if you have very very close points, it will take longer, but it's still polynomial basically. So um, so that's great. I won't quiz you over that or anything. Um, but the one thing I do want to point out that maybe I would quiz you on, I'm not sure, but, but the, it is an important point, um, <clears throat> is that this is not just true for two dimensional data, and that's going to become very relevant when we hop to images in a second. Um, this is true for data of any dimension. So this will still work in three dimensions, four dimensions, 100 dimensions, a million dimensions. The same result applies. So that, that's really, really important. OK. So let's keep going. So Frank Rosenblatt, even though I've shown you his algorithm on these like 2D grids, he didn't really care about that. He didn't do this 2D grid thing. Maybe he did. But his machine that he built actually processed a 20 by 20 grid of what he called photo cells which was really just a basic camera, like a basic image detector. Because he was really interested, remember, in perception, right, in, in what we're talking about in this class, in computer vision, right? Here's an image from his paper. Um, he's drawn this a little bit differently, but, but really this is, these are his photoreceptors, um, and he's processing it using a neuron, which is exactly what McCulloch and Pitts did. Um, and let's get into this in more detail. But before I do, I, I just want to underline a point really quick. Um, so here are two examples, and I've just made these synthetic images, um, but th they, they are images. Um, these are 20 by 20 grids, just like Frank Rosenblatt used in his paper. I just want to make sure the connection is clear. So I've just done a bunch of math and shown you a bunch of stuff about two-dimensional um, machine learning problems, basically, where we just have points, then each point is described by two numbers, an x and a y, or an x1 and an x2. <clears throat> We're about to hop to images, right? And I just want to really, really emphasize that the only difference between a data point like this and an image is just the dimension. All it has to do with is the, is the number of numbers that we need to describe that point. So this point could be a picture of a dog, right? But it wouldn't be in two-dimensional space anymore. It would be in a space that has the number of dimensions equal to the number of pixels in the image. So if I have a 20 by 20 pixel image, right, I'm no longer in, in two-dimensional space. Uh, what, what, dimension, what is the dimension of the space I'm in if I have 20 by 20 pixel grayscale images? Um, throw it in the chat window. What dimension is Frank Rosenblatt really working in? Not two-dimensional space. What dimension? Good guess, Sean. Good guess, Abhijit. Both incorrect. Good guess, good guess. And don't be discouraged when you get it wrong. Guessing and getting it wrong is better than saying nothing. <laughs> Guessing is good. All right, three, nope, incorrect, incorrect. Let me explain it a little more. Good guesses, no one's correct yet. Okay, so let me emphasize. So this toy data, right, it's two by, it's, it's two dimensional. It has an X and a Y. It's almost like a two pixel image, right? Frank Rosenblatt's data was 20 pixels by 20 pixels, right? 
So how many variables, how many unique numbers are in a 20 by 20 pixel grayscale image? 400, great, thank you, Ryan and Bonaventure. Yep, perfect, good. So really, Frank Rosenblatt, back in the 50s, was solving this problem in 400 dimensional space, which might sound crazy, but it's not, I promise. Um, and I saw Abhijit, I think, asked a really good question. Yeah, he said, will it still be linearly separable? So we'll get into that, Abhijit, really, really good question, because in 400 dimensional space, there still is an idea of a linear separator, right? Does that exist? Okay, so just think about, you know, this is in two dimensional space, Imagine now, I know it's hard to think about, but imagine we're in 400 dimensional space and these points all of a sudden are pictures of let's say bricks and balls or cats and dogs. And you wanna separate the pictures of the bricks from the pictures of the balls, right? So instead of finding the best line in two dimensional space, we're now finding the best plane or it's called generally a, a hyperplane. We're finding the best hyperplane in 400 dimensional space that will separate the little points that correspond to the images of the, of the cats or the dogs from the images of the, well, let me, let me do bricks and balls, sorry. That'll separate the images of the bricks from the images of, of the balls. So it's the same exact math. That's what I wanna emphasize. We're about to try to use the same math in a much higher dimensional space and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so that's the idea. All right, so here we go. So here are two examples, right? And this, is, this would just be, imagine two points in high dimensional space, right? Or you can kind of picture them on a scatter plot if you want. Um, so each of these points is described by 400 values, the 400 pixel values. And in this case, they're just ones and zeros. Um, so let's ask the class, let's do another poll, Rohan, when you're ready. Um, if we take, the, if we take Rosenblatt's perceptron algorithm and we process these two images with the perceptron algorithm, Will it be able to correctly classify them? Will it learn a hyperplane that separates this one brick from this one ball? So take a few seconds, answer the poll, and I'm curious to see what you think. Do you think the perceptron algorithm will work in 400 dimensional space? Will it find a separator? Uh, professor, 70% mm -hmm. so of students say yes, and 30% mm -hmm. of students say no. Okay, excellent, good. So most of you are believers, some folks are not. Good, I like the skepticism as well. Um, Sean asked a good question. What if we have more than two labels? Sean, we will get to that, I promise. Not in today's lecture, but we will get there. Don't worry. Um, and yeah, you're right, Sai, this is a binary classifier. True. Okay, so let's try it. So I'm going to walk through some code that tries exactly what I was just talking about. Um, I have some code to make these synthetic images. So here's a, a synthetic image of a ball. We'll use real data soon, but here's a synthetic image of a brick, very simple brick. Um, and we're gonna do literally the same exact code. So notice the dimension of X, right? So this is X. Um, it's two by 400, because we have two examples and each has 400 pixels. And Y, those are just our labels, so just zero and one. Um, we're gonna do the same trick as last time. We're gonna append a, a vector of ones to the end. We're gonna initialize by zeros and I'm gonna take 25 steps. So I'm gonna take 25 steps. I'm gonna keep updating our neuron just like we did before. And if I look at my results, you'll see that it gets it wrong a couple times and it computes new weights just like I did before. But ultimately, it ends up getting everything correct actually. So we are able to learn a linear separator that tells apart uh, this image from that image. And again, it's exactly what we did before, but instead of being in two dimensional space, we're just in, you know, just 400 dimensional space. No problem, right? <laughs> it's really interesting. It's really hard to visualize, but the same math works, which I think is pretty cool. <clears throat> math kind of is our gateway into higher dimensions, right? It's, it's kind of crazy. Okay, so now we're gonna up the ante and we don't have a lot of time yet. So we left, we won't do a poll this time just to kind of keep things moving. Um, but the next thing is this. So let's up it to, to nine examples of bricks, nine examples of balls. Is it possible, 
right? So take five seconds, think to yourself, see what you want to bet on, possible or not possible. I'll pause just for one second so you can think. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance, and I wish I could see what you're thinking, but we got to keep moving just because class is almost over. Um, so here I'm going to make a couple of data sets. That's cool. I'm going to reshape them. Notice that X is now going to be of dimension 18 by 400, I believe, when we get to it here. My computer is struggling. All right, 18 by 400, so there's 18 examples. Um, I'm going to initialize the weights. I'm going to run it for 250 iterations. So here it's here we got one incorrect. We're adjusting the weights, correct, incorrect. I can scroll down and see all the printouts. Let's see. What we're kind of looking for is by the end, do we get them all correct? Let's see. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. There we go. Finally, by the end. Although, you know, this is not that many correct in a row. I might run it for a little longer. Um, I guess the thing that I want to tell you is that this will work. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So we eventually we do find an answer that correctly classifies all of these ball images from all these brick images. So now, in our last few minutes of class, <clears throat> what I really want to do is up the ante further. So here we go. So this is real data. So this data might look familiar. This is actually just exactly the data you used in your programming challenge for module one. Um, but I have downsized it to be of size <clears throat> 20 by 20, just like Frank Rosa blot. We also have grayscale images now. So these are not just black and white. I'm oh, sorry, they are black and white, but they're not just zero and one. So these are grayscale images. Um, but the same math applies. They just have floating point values, or they have values between 0 and 255. Um, and we're going to do the same exact thing. So take a second. Do you think that Rosenblatt will succeed for synthetic or for real data? Excuse me. So just take a second and see what you think. And I'm going to get into the math. And this is where it gets really fun. And this is actually a perfect spot to pause. We've got just a few minutes. This is fantastic. This will give you some good stuff to chew on until Thursday. OK. So I have made an animation, which I like to do when I have time, <laughs> of, uh, of what's going to happen here. So this is an animation. We can visualize the perceptron algorithm learning from data. So here we go. So here are nine examples, right? And for each frame, I'm going to, um, I'm going to pick one. So just like, just like Rosenblatt told us, he said, hey, just take one example at a time. I'm going to take this example. I'm going to pass it through my neuron um, and what what you'll see here in a second so <clears throat> this will become more clear in a moment but let me just ask the question to the group so we know that we have four uh, well let me back up a little bit sorry so what is the length of x remember that in our formula we have our weights w and we have our data x and we take a dot product of the two right um what is the length of x in this case throw it in the chat window how long is our vector x good guess ravina nine not quite correct though so remember, x is our, is our data, represents x, right? And every image is 20 by 20. So how many numbers are there? There's 400, right? Yep, perfect. So x is a length 400, because we have 400 pixels in each one of these images. It's 20 by 20. OK. What then is the length of w? How many weights do we have? What is the length of w? OK, Abhijit says 400 plus 1. Um, yeah, that's fine. 400 or 401, depending on how you set this up. But here's what I really want to emphasize. So remember that, that this dot product, w dot x, right? That's the kind of the core of the McCulloch and Pitts neuron, right? So when you do this, you take every x value. And now, since we're dealing with images, it's every pixel value. And you multiply it by a weight, right? And those weights, w, that vector w, it's going to be learned as we train our model, as we, as we, as we progress our perceptron algorithm. Um, and what we can do is we can actually visualize our weights as their own image. I know this looks boring right now. It'll look interesting in a second, I promise. Um, but this image has values of all 0. Um, but as our model learns, you'll kind of see this change. And we've, just, we've taken that 400 length vector and just put it into a 20 by 20 grid, just like our images are. So you know this pixel and that image will be multiplied by this corresponding pixel in the weight image. Um, this image down here, this shows w dot x, and this will become more clear as we visualize. But the last thing I'll say in this animation that we're going to play in a minute is that um, we might play it next time. We'll see. Um, but uh, I've drawn a green box here. Um, the green box indicates that we've gotten this example right, so we will not be updating our weights. So this is like step zero. So let me scroll down here. Here's step one. 
So we hop to our next example, right? And again, the box is green, which just like in our two-dimensional example, it means that we got the example right, so our weights do not update. And now here's where I think it's gonna get interesting, right? So step two, actually, no, it's not interesting yet. So step two of our, of our training, we actually get this example right again and we, nothing happens. But now, and, I, and I'll play these all in a sequence in a minute in like an animation, but here's what I really wanna show you. This is the last thing I think I want you to think about. So again, we're visualizing this perceptron algorithm learning, right? We get to step three and the red box means that we've gotten an example wrong, okay? Now here's what I want you to really think about, and we're just about out of time, so I can leave this as an open question. Look what happened to our weights, right? So following uh, Frank Rosenblatt's perceptron algorithm, our new weights look like this, right? So what do they look like? What do you see in the weights? What does it look just like? <laughs> it looks like a brick, right? Yeah, and why is that? Why does it look like the brick? Yeah, zero plus brick equals brick, <laughs> right? Exactly. It's actually zero minus brick, I think, the it flips. Um, and that's, actually, no, it's not zero minus. It's, yeah, it's just plus, yep, because, yes, mm -hmm, it hasn't flipped. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> um, that's what Rosenblatt's algorithm tells us to do. So I'm not going to give away the answer yet. You can look at my notes if you want, and you can see the answer. Maybe I encourage you to do that. But next time, we're going to come back, and we're going to see the entire thing training, and we're going to see if doing this simple adding and subtracting bricks and balls from the weights, can that learn a separator, right? Can it learn to classify our data? Um, so that's it for today. Thank you for your time. Uh, I promise we'll have some, I'll have some things sorted out on my side by Thursday, so it'll be a little less wonky of a setup. But I did, I did enjoy having Rohan uh, help me out with the poll. That was fun. Um, so thanks for your time today, guys. Um, we will see you on Thursday. Have a great week.